I'm here to introduce Dr. June Scobie Rogers. Now, I met June at an International Astronautical Congress uh, a while back. It was in 1984 in Lausanne, Switzerland. And she and her husband, Dick, and my wife and I had dinner together at Girardet's restaurant in Lausanne, which some of you may have heard of. Uh, it's a famous restaurant. And we at that time were inspired by the presence of Dick Scobie and his wife, June. About a year and a few months after that, as you may know, Dick, who was the commander of the Challenger mission, was aboard when the Challenger was lost following its launch in January 1986. Uh, June might have been destroyed by that. Many people have been destroyed by similar occurrences. But instead, she built a monument to the memory of the Challenger and her husband. That monument is very different from the kind of monuments we see anywhere else. The monument is a live, vibrant, dedication to the future of the people who will be our space engineers and scientists in the future. It's called the Challenger Centers, and the Challenger Centers represent a major factor in addressing the primary issue in the space field today, which is who is going to carry on the tradition that we have developed over the past 50 years? Who will be the next generation, not just of space scientists, but of scientists and engineers who will further the development of mankind as no other group can possibly do? And I'm not going to tell you anything about the Challenger Centers because that's what Dr. Scobie is here to do today. And I therefore take great pleasure in introducing Dr. June Scobie Rogers, who is the founding director and current chairman of the Challenger Centers. June. Thank you, and, and thank you all for, for being here. It's, it's lovely to be in Glasgow, and it's an honor that the ISA asked me to speak. And Jerry Gray, that was a delightful introduction. Thank you so much. I have been introduced as the widow of Challenger Commander Dick Scobie many times uh, as the author of Silver Linings. Um, but most of all, I'm just known as the spacey lady from back home where I come from. Um, I, I, I think that it's more important than being remembered for titles or trophies is being remembered for a testimony, and that's what I want to share with you today. I tell you that story not because I'm proud, but because I've learned not to be too proud. I am the founding chairman of the Challenger Center for Space Science Education, and I do want to share with you the story of how we inspire students, engage teachers, and how we're working toward educating the workforce of tomorrow. We just had a room full of young students, and I look forward to opportunities just as they created here in the United Kingdom for students to help them uh, make learning, so teachers can help make learning relevant. That's what we do at Challenger Center. The title is to introduce the wonders of space. It's uh, Challenger Center really creates the building blocks for learning. We're the pipeline to uh, more formal education in which we hope to inspire students to study the sciences and maths and to go into the careers of science, technology, engineering, and per perhaps even the medical field. We have a tremendous shortage in that area around the world. The Challenger crew, my husband Dick Scobie is in the front middle, and just behind him over his right shoulder is Krista McAuliffe, the school teacher that was aboard Challenger. They were so enthusiastic about their opportunity to fly in space and so happy 
to be known as the Teacher in Space mission. Um, it was a dream come true for both me and Dick Scobie because I had been a teacher and then a college professor and he had become a pilot, test pilot, and an astronaut. And we met and married as teenagers, both of us sharing our dreams. Well, often we're asked, well, why, why space exploration? Those of you that have been here uh, at the conference have heard many stories about why it's so important. Um, and for our students, I often talk to them about you carry around your cell phone, you use a GPS to find your way, satellites for television, MRI, they're all a part of the uh, experience brought back from exploration in space. But reporters, in particular, often ask me, why, you know, since you've lost your husband in a Challenger accident, why do you think that space exploration is so important? And I ask, is it because those who take the risks believe that the rewards far outweigh the risk? You know, without risk, there's no new knowledge, no discovery, no bold adventure. And of course, we all know the greatest risk is to take no risk at all. The space pioneers are primarily engineers and scientists, and they're on a quest to learn, to explore. They have a sense of adventure, and they're scouts forging the way for our students to follow. But what about the workforce shortage in this aerospace industry? The former Lockheed Martin CEO, Norm Augustine, conducted a study with the National Academy's Committee on Science, Engineering, and Public Policy titled The Gathering Storm. He said in his report, in a world where advanced knowledge is widespread, our advantages in science and technology have begun to erode. Across our country and around the world, there's a growing concern regarding the number of students entering science, technology, engineering, and medical careers. And we know that one way to reverse that trend is to make science and math fascinating and applicable for students. We want to make learning relevant. So rather than hear a teacher speak about it, as I'm doing, why not get them involved in interacting and experimenting with opportunities to fly in space in a simulated experience? Well, what was the beginning? Dick Scobie and I married. We had these children, two children, and a, and a bunch of puppies. He wanted to be an engineer. I wanted to be a teacher. My life changed when I was a teenager and met him. I had grown up the poorest in the poorest family among poor neighbors and was teased often that I would never see the inside of a college, much less be a teacher. And Dick was told that if he didn't know someone as important as a senator, how could he possibly dream of being an officer in the military, much less uh, becoming a test pilot or an astronaut? But we did fulfill our dreams. Dick became an Air Force pilot and eventually accepted the test pilot position. I loved teaching every grade from the young children all the way through university. I often used the theme of aerospace to motivate my students. Dick Scobie and I shared adventures in airplanes and on motorcycles. When our children were teenagers and busy with their own lives and friends, I decided to return to the university. I I was working hard, but I felt I was neglecting my students, so the la my ch own children. So the last year I volunteered at the dinner table that I was giving up that dream for a while. My children uh, were disappointed, and Dick Scobie said he knew how much education meant to me, and he was saddened about my decision. Because you see, growing up, these children who teased me about being a teacher had um, had discouraged me in many ways, and I wanted to prove that I did, in a sense, have the right stuff and that I could go on to college. My children the next day brought me a gift clumsily wrapped in brown paper. When I uncovered it, it had a, a it was a, a, a brass plate that had the words Dr. June Scobie on it. Um, I think the Greek word for um, encourage means to put heart into. And my children 
um, dedicated the following year to helping their mother finish her uh, PhD and move on to my dream of becoming a college professor. That afternoon when we returned home, Dick Scobie, who had been an astronaut already, um, wrote on our mailbox, Dr. and Mr. Scobie. So he was proud that I had accomplished that dream as well. So, Astronaut Corps 1978, he was among the very first 35 space shuttle astronauts. He uh, was excited to be appointed with the first women who were assigned as, as teachers. His first flight was the Solar Max Repair mission. Um, it was an extremely successful mission, very important because they wanted to uh, fly that man maneuvering unit and use it to repair a satellite, something that it was created for. Um, they worked diligently with a team around the world to conduct those experiments and to repair that satellite. When he returned home from space, um, everyone was waiting to talk to him. Reporters, neighbors were at the door, and since we had grown up together as children with these dreams fulfilled, he whisked me away and said, before I tell reporters what it's like to fly in space, I want to tell you. So we slipped out the back door, went to our favorite restaurant, and as we sat at the table with the stars in the, sh in the sky shining as bright as those in his eyes, he told me all about what it was like to fly in space. But he kept dropping everything on the table because he was accustomed to handing it out and having it float in space. So whether it was a camera that he was taking a picture of us or napkins that uh, he kept stuffing under his table for fear it might float away, he shared the joy and excitement of what it was like to fly in space. But after a bit, I said to him, you know, while you were in flying, President Reagan interviewed every one of you uh, and, and mentioned everybody's name, but forgot to say who you were. Didn't that make you mad? And he said, no, June, what was important was the mission. We got the job done. It was, it was a successful mission. So you can imagine that later when President Reagan announced that Krista McAuliffe would be the one of 10 teachers uh, selected to fly in space, how joyous I was when she was assigned to Commander Dick Scobie, because now I would be able to support him in the realm of education. The winner, of course, was Krista, and her backup was Barbara Morgan. Krista had an interest uh, from students around the world who were waiting from her lessons from space. We became good friends as we talked about what those lessons would be and the other spouses of the Challenger crew and she and Barbara came together in my home just before Christmas, just before their flight in January. Perhaps you remember where you were when we lost the Challenger. It was a tremendous loss to the nation. It was a loss to the children who were waiting for the lessons and it was particularly a loss to the families. We wanted to make a difference because the world knew how they died. We came together and said, let's tell the world how they lived. So rather than build monuments, let's provide an opportunity for children to experience what they love so much. We had such high hopes and dreams come true, tremendous joy and excitement, and then the unspeakable happened. That day, the bright light in our lives turned dark when we were told there's no hope, all are lost. No one survived. Numbing silence, no hope, we said. Our world was shattered, the shuttle broke into a million pieces, just like our hearts, and shock and grief and sorrow came to us. It helps when the nation mourns with you, but it also hurts when a gaping wound of grief becomes so public. My daughter explained our loss when she wrote in a letter to the children who lost their parents, their parents aboard Columbia. 
she said to the children, you're not alone. Our nation mourns with you, but yours is also a personal loss that's separate from this national tragedy. The Challenger explosion was a national tragedy. Everyone saw it, everyone hurt, everyone grieved, everyone wanted to help. But my daughter wrote to them, that did not make it easier for me. They wanted to say goodbye to American heroes. I, I just wanted to say goodbye to my daddy. Well, within a few months, all of the families came together and then Vice President Bush invited us to Washington and said, I hear you have a dream that you want to continue that mission. Yes, the mission was important. A teacher was aboard. Children were still waiting for lessons. So from our imagination, we presented the idea to Vice President Bush who offered to help us by sharing our hope to a nation. Everyone was saddened by the loss of Challenger. We knew that we couldn't launch satellites or conduct scientific experiments aboard a space shuttle, but we knew we could continue that education mission. At first, everywhere I turned, there were naysayers. There were people who said, ah, you can't do that. It's never been done. What? Who are you to think you could create something like that? But a few believed, and Vice President Bush helped us. Now, a funny story about my son, who was a strapping teenager at the time. He answered the phone one morning and came to the back of the house where I was and said, Mom, would the Vice President of the United States be calling you? I said, it could be, Rich. He buried his head and said, oh, no, and, and said, Mom, you should go to the phone. I think he's on the telephone. So I talked to then Vice President Bush, who said, come to Washington. We want to help you, and then finished the conversation with, and by the way, that was quite a character that answered the phone. So I went back to Rich Scobie and said, what did he mean? He said, Honly, honestly, Mom, I didn't answer the phone, Scobie's bar and grill. But he often did, so I wasn't surprised about that one. But he said, when this strange man was calling you early in the morning, I wanted to know who he was. He said he was the vice president. And so I just said, well, the vice president of what? <laughs> well, the vice president became president and told the story to a crowd of thousands with Richard Scobie in the audience. Richard was a lieutenant in the Air Force, buried his head and said, no, no, my commander-in-chief, I'll never get promoted. But he's now a colonel, commander in Kirkuk in Iraq, and he's doing all right, in spite of his goofiness. The family resolved, you know, just how can we do this? A glimmer of light came to us that I call the ABCs based on reading a book called The Power of Positive Thinking when I was a child. A stood for attitude. You must accept the problem, and make it a challenge. And B was for belief. Believe in yourself and believe in a power greater than yourself. And C was for commitment. Make a commitment to make a difference in this world. So I just applied my ABCs after the Challenger accident to say, why couldn't we, the families, make a difference? We resolved to create the first interactive space science education center and we used the ABCs to do that. Take our ability to make a difference, believe in ourselves, and make a commitment to make a difference for the youth around the world waiting for lessons. I wrote the book Silver Linings to tell this story of triumph. And the story was featured on news and morning television shows on Oprah Winfrey, The Hour of Power, and magazines and newspapers. I shared that story because I wanted others to know that they could take a tragedy and turn it into something that would, could be known as a triumph. And we named it Silver Linings behind, because behind every dark cloud is a silver lining. We created, in the first 10 years, 25 Challenger Learning Centers across the United States. We wanted to advance science literacy we wanted to use simulation to spark an interest in science and math and technology for students. Our Challenger Learning Center network now reaches 53 around the, around the world. 500,000 students a year, 25,000 teachers, 
with hands-on, exciting opportunities to learn about space in their own, very own space mission. Now our map reaches across the United States, out to Alaska, down to Hawaii, across to the United Kingdom, and over to Seoul, South Korea. So we're just beginning to reach around our part to our partners in the space industry so that we can motivate youngsters around the world to have an interest in space science. Also, because it's so important that we motivate the students to study these subjects so that we can benefit our nation and our, around our planet, the workforce shortage in these fields of science, technology, engineering, and math. You can learn more about the locations uh, by going to the website challenger.org. Click on challenger.org and you can click to any of these Challenger Learning Centers. Primarily the University of Leicester has a brilliant Challenger Learning Center and even though all of these simulators and mission control centers are, are built exactly alike, the one at Leicester uh, is extremely, is a leader of all of these learning centers because the directors are so brilliant and they add to the knowledge for everybody else. Just as the one that we built in Seoul, Korea, they, as we grow, we grow smarter and we learn about more opportunities to provide for our youth. We never dreamed that the first Challenger Center would grow into such a vibrant worldwide network, that it would reach across the United States, up to Canada, over to Europe and Asia, that it would be recognized by the Department of Labor in the United States, by NASA, by the Department of Education, with reward, with awards of all kinds. And the awards in each case are to make a difference in the lives of children for inspiring students to pursue careers in science, math, technology, and engineering. But no awards mean more to me than stepping inside one of the, do the doors of a Challenger Learning Center to see the youngsters on their own mission to the moon or to Mars, and to see them working together as a team to solve problems uh, as they simulate their own space mission. They cannot be interrupted, even if leaders in our nation, a president or a first lady steps into a Challenger Learning Center, the, the students' eyes will not be taken away from their own experiments or their own navigation teams as they monitor their work aboard a Challenger Learning Center. It's a thrill to see them in action. Later, if any of you have questions, I'll tell you the story about Jerome that's close to my heart, who uh, had been in trouble for many years and we won his heart at a Challenger Learning Center. The scenarios to Earth, to Mars, to Comet, to Moon, and Journey to Jupiter are all a part of the missions that children participate in when they visit a Challenger Learning Center. And there are mission teams. We work closely with the youngsters to learn that any job in life determines that they need to be able to work as a team member to accomplish a great feat. The medical team, life support, remote uses robots to handle hazardous materials. Navigation, those students help find the way. Communications. The mission, half the students work in a mission control. The other half of the students climb aboard a space station. The education content is structured to support our national science education standards as well as those of each country where we build a Challenger Learning Center. The key is to cooperate, is for the youngsters to cooperate, to work together to solve the problems, to make decisions. With this power of simulation, the children see themselves working in a career field in these areas that we are so encouraged to, to share with them. Perhaps you've seen Miles O'Brien, a news commentator on CNN. He has interviewed me a dozen times about the Challenger Center, and he has been our master of ceremonies at several of our programs to share the story about what our youth are doing at the Challenger Learning Centers across the country. He's a great friend, and um, he better than any of us can tell that story with his broadcast voice. 
We have many programs that we offer for teachers as well. And yes, that is me flying like Superman up on the zero G. I was a guest of Richard Garriott, who, my former student, who invited several people to fly aboard the zero G, and it was thrilling. And as you can see, all the activities that we provide for teachers are to inspire, are to help them inspire the students and to motivate teachers to encourage the students to go into these fields. Is it, it is exciting, whether it's working with rockets or conducting a scientific mission aboard the Challenger Center, or hopefully we'll have more teachers fly with me on the zero G. We have tremendous opportunities for web resources. Um, there are downlink programs, in fact, within a couple of weeks, October the 19th, I believe, Richard Garriott will have his downlink to us in the United States for the youngsters who have questions. They've competed all across the country and around the world. These students have, who have won the opportunity to ask a question, I will work with them as we um, ask Richard in space if he will demonstrate to us the answers to the questions that these students have been selected to ask. Um, not long ago, perhaps you remember that Barbara Morgan, the backup teacher to Krista, was, was trained to be an educator astronaut. She was trained along the astronauts, not merely a passenger flying. So Barbara flew in space, and to the right of the screen you see her uh, when we had the opportunity for NASA to to have the downlink presentation so the youngsters could ask the questions to her to demonstrate. So Richard Garriott is following up on the heels of Barbara Morgan as we, uh, we learn from him uh, the experiments that he's sharing, many from in England, others from the United States and South Korea. And he will respond with those experiments, bring them back to Earth, and he will answer their questions while he's flying in space. Barbara Morgan um, has left NASA to go back into education. I'm proud of her for that decision. She uh, came full circle to follow through with a teacher in space mission. She serves on our board with the Challenger Center, and she's an inspiration to anyone for persistence because for two, de two decades she studied along with astronauts and waited patiently for her opportunity to fly in space. We have uh, partnered with many organizations, including NASA, for students to link to the Challenger Center website, learn what they can do to conduct scientific experiments, to, to follow through with us on the engineering design. So we have opportunities to, for science and for engineering and for technology. So all your, those of you that have children or students, or youth or know a teacher, remind them that they can find these opportunities to take back to the classroom by going to our website. Now, Richard Garriott, my former student, and who's about to fly into space with the Russians and work aboard the International Space Station. Um, he, I knew him as a teenager. And he was so brilliant with his computer games that I asked him if he wouldn't help me design the very first Challenger Learning Center. He went back to his company, came up with an idea of how we could connect with fiber optics, and we were off with the design of the Challenger Center. Not long ago, he called me to fly in with him in that zero G and announced that he was going aboard the Russians. And I said to him, but Richard, that's a very expensive flight, like $30 million. How did you come up with that? He said, I earned it in my computer game business. So Richard Garriott is off and going. I'm proud that he's accomplished so much and that he is willing to share that entire time on the International Space Station with education experiments for students. One of the opportunities he pr he's providing with his uh, gaming experience is what we're calling sports in space. Um, children, anyone, uh, adults can link on our website and go to the sports and space game. And you can, um, the first one is, is either kicking a football or throwing a football or being tackled and you compare it to what it would be like with earth gravity. 
and then you go on to moon gravity, and then you go on to Mars gravity. And it does get a bit more complicated, and it took me several tries before I could um, toss that football and get it to the receiver. But it's a, it's a game that he's already provided for us that children right away can uh, link on to and get involved to learn a little bit more about a comparative analysis of weightlessness and on the planets and, and in space. Richard has so many opportunities for us, and one of them uh, that he's sharing is this idea um, based on what his father saw in space over two decades ago, nearly three, when he was flying aboard and, and now comparing the photographs that he took of the planet to the photographs that Richard will be taking of the planet. We know that it's a very vulnerable uh, ball that's, that's out in orbit, flying, and, and we care about this planet. Uh, many astronauts who have flown have come back to say, I want to be more involved with environmental problems and, and concerns of the planet. And right away, Richard has offered to, ha to let's look at the differences in what man has done in the last 30 years or in changing the environment. One of our Challenger Learning Centers, the most recent, is at Seoul, South Korea. It's called the Next Generation Simulator. Um, you know, God made this a beautiful, incredible universe. It's colorful and fantastic. And what we are all about at Challenger Center is using the best technology and other teaching tools available today to immerse the kids and teachers and our youth and young adults in this universe experience, this amazing universe experience. It's a fully immersive education experience. And, and it is, it's a they're not very expensive, but they truly do add a, a, ma a great amount of quality to inspiring youngsters to learn more about this universe that they live in. Many scientific experiments these youngsters conduct aboard their Challenger Learning Center as they fly off into space. Uh, a more recent Challenger Learning Center opened its doors in New York City in Manhattan, near where we lost the World Trade Centers. These are the en this is the entrance into the center. This is the workstation um, and the simulator where the youngsters work with their experiments at the life support team or navigating. And it comes alive when the youngsters climb aboard in their mission control and they guide the students aboard their simulating space. Many of our centers have built their own Space Shuttle, College of Engineers, for example, at the University of Tennessee, built one that has been replicated in other learning centers. Some of them have a special room, kind of like a beam me up Scotty Star Trek room. The youngsters, um, they have to defer their um, disbelief so that they can use imagination in order to have a real, a real experience aboard. We have opportunities for children uh, that we now call micronauts. So even the preschool young children can have an experience at a Challenger Learning Center. Children uh, who have uh, disabilities can come along, inclu including the, this dog's master who was blind. We brought in his, um, his young um, mascot dog we, that they named Comet and Comet flew a mission with us. I thought you'd enjoy that. Many uh, and bring about art as well as science to the Challenger Learning Centers. Uh, the interior uh, of the Learning Centers are beautiful with replications of, of space art, or in this case, a sculpture. Um, we have opportunities to partner with many organizations, as I mentioned before. In um, Kentucky, they are known for mining coal, and some of the astronauts go there to study about how they might mine on the moon. Our chairman of Challenger Center, Bill Reedy, joined um, some of the folks working at the mines in Kentucky to conduct experiments with them and so astronauts could learn more about mining. And the students at the three Challenger Learning Centers across Kentucky came up with the, what they call the Mars Invasion Experiment. At the University of Leicester, our own Buzz Aldrin, a uh, second man to step on the moon, joined the students to celebrate 
um, the work there of the foundation. And uh, as you can see, the students were excited to have one of the early Apollo astronauts join them. We have students who have attended a Challenger Learning Center, flown in space with us, and now they are astronauts. So dreams really can come true. And we're proud that youngsters not only become astronauts, but they become scientists working with NASA, or they become medical physicians or sur and surgeons, or they become navigators and they become pilots. They work in all these realms of science, technology, engineering, and math. Our Challenger Learning Center in Paducah is a, a great um, example of how a community came together, a community college, to say they wanted to have a beautiful facility so that students from across Kentucky could visit, and Tennessee and other states, could visit their Challenger Learning Center. Uh, it's a beautiful center. The interior is exactly like all the other Challenger Learning Centers that we helped to build, but they built this interesting exterior. And as you walk inside, the flags hanging all represent all the schools of the students who have attended. So just as today, we, com we congratulated the winners of students who are flying their experiments aboard uh, Richard Garriott's mission, we would list all those schools and, list their, and, and hang their banners to celebrate all of the students. Well, John Denver, perhaps some of you remember his music, he asked if he could be a board member for Challenger Center uh, and joined our team and sang a song for us. He titled it, Flying For Me. The Challenger crew were flying for us and they were flying for generations to come to make a difference, to learn, to explore, to discover, to reach into the future. Because each step of the way, the pioneer opens the door a little more into the wide, beautiful universe. The Challenger Center concept began during a conversation in my home among the families of the Challenger crew. In the two decades that have followed, more than 8 million students have experienced a Challenger Learning Center spaceflight. And our mission has only just begun. How about a million a year? Perhaps only a dream, but if we accept the challenge to continue to adapt and to adopt to the changing world around us, and if we believe in ourselves, and the mission, and we make the commitment, then together, around this planet, from imagination to dreams, we can be the dream makers. Well, why do we at Challenger Center want to make a difference? Because we believe in our mission, inspiring, exploring, learning. And we believe in the space industry and education, space education mission, your mission, discovering new worlds, creating a better tomorrow, and always reaching, teaching, and touching the future. Thank you for this opportunity to share our story from imagination to reality. Thank you very much. There are, there are a couple of, there are about 10 minutes in case there are questions. If anyone has questions, I'd be happy to answer them for you. Yes. The, the funding. Yeah. Ac across the United States, the funding is primarily uh, uh, created by private and public sector. So uh, leaders in industry um, help us and leaders in government help us. So perhaps a governor of a state would say they wanted to have a Challenger Learning Center and they would provide some funding. Um, of course, leaders in industry, in the aerospace industry, they want to, to encourage students to go into these fields so that we'll have the workforce of the future. So they help to fund it as well. I think at the University of Leicester, uh, actually the Queen's uh, money in the year 2000 went to help create uh, the Leicester Challenger Learning Center in Seoul, South Korea. 
it was a, a very wealthy man who said he wanted to be remembered for something extraordinary. So he built the Challenger Learning Center alongside of a, a planetarium as well. Yes. Uh, is there a quality threshold that you have to adopt as a board to ensure that people don't use the name for the wrong reasons? Yeah, uh, the quality threshold for Challenger Center yeah. or Challenger Th Learning Center. Yes, thank you very much. We, we have coined the phrase for ourselves and we um, discourage anyone else's use of the phrase. Um, we are known throughout the world for what we've accomplished. Some people have created some similar kinds of activities, but they don't go beyond their own territory. They don't grow nationally. Uh, our joy in building the Challenger Center is it belongs to the community. So the one at Leicester belongs to, to the United Kingdom. The one in Seoul, South Korea belongs there. And I, I am proud to, that um, I have a very good friend who's in the audience, Soyeon, who is an astronaut who has the microphone now. Why don't you ask your question, Soyeon? Okay, I think uh, for educating children and inspiring children, I think uh, teacher is really important. So how about your training program for teacher? And then maybe there's so many centers there, so you need so many teachers also. And then how can I be the teacher of that challenger center? <laughs> <laughs> how can you be the teacher of that challenger center in Seoul, South Korea? I think that you are already the teacher because you're inspiring so many students from your experience of having flown in space the very first astronaut from South Korea. Um, just your role model is a great teaching lesson. And besides that, you're a woman. So you can say to the young women of South Korea, you can also make a difference. So we're all very proud of you. Uh, teachers can apply to be a learning center director any, at any of our centers. In fact, we grow careers, teachers, um, who have taught in the schools come to our learning center to apply for a position. We train them in the field and they, they go on to be the authority in their own community and in their state and even in the nation. Um, we learn, we have a conference every year where all of these teacher directors come, they wear their space flight suits, they come to our conference and they learn from each other. So we can only become that much smarter as we come together and learn from each other. So we hope you'll join us next year um, in, in our conference in, in uh, early September in the United States. And I look forward to joining you at this conference next year in South Korea. Any other questions? I have a friend here from Australia. Um, thank you for joining us, and I hope someday that we can build a Challenger Learning Center for the students of Australia. Um, I've spoken there before, and uh, Dick Scobie had carried some artifacts from Australia when he flew in space, and though they lost the Challenger space shuttle when it crashed upon the sea, some of those artifacts came to the surface, and I returned them to Australia. Yes, that's a wonderful story that uh, you, w you know, they were able to recover those artefacts and uh, that you were able to bring them back to Australia. Uh, I wanted to actually offer just a comment on one of the things you said early in your uh, presentation, which was about the, the issue of risk and how exploring space is a risk and uh, we need to be prepared to accept that risk because as you said, the biggest risk we have is that we don't take any. Yes. And I think that's an extremely important issue uh, for young people, because I see, I do teach uh, uh, young university students in one part of my work, and uh, I find that uh, there is a perception now of people not being prepared to take risks. Um, how should, um, just trying to find the best way to express it, you know, the, you do find among younger people in some areas that they, they you know, our society is becoming extremely or increasingly risk averse. And I think we need places like the Challenger Centre to inspire young people to remember that you take the bold steps by taking the risks. 
Thank you. I would love to quote you at some time. That's beautifully said. Uh, when Dick Scobie spoke to students who asked him, you know, are you afraid to fly in space? He said, uh, better to, to make a difference, to, to join with a team of people who are, are, are pioneers, who are reaching out, not unlike the early pioneers that sailed the sea or crossed the country in a Conestago wagon. We believe in our mission and we're willing to take those risks. And without risk, there's no new knowledge. You know, there's no discovery. There's no bold adventure. All of which help the human spirit to soar. Um, so with that, in your words, um, we'll step boldly forward. And I demonstrated that when I flew aboard the Zero G myself. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, you, you've been a delightful audience. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>